Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program, Veterans in PD, Social Connection and Empowerment. I'm Sarah Maldonado, and I'm the Community Program Manager for the Parkinson's Foundation in Arizona. As an employee of the Parkinson's Foundation and the wife of a veteran, I'm thrilled to be here with you today to bring you this educational program. We'd like to take a second and hear from our audience. There will be a poll popping up in a few seconds, but we'd love to see who all is joining us today and find out what branch of the military you or your loved one served in. We'll give everyone a couple seconds to answer that and see the results. Excellent, looks like we have quite a few people from the Army, the Marine Corps. All right, excellent, thank you. All right, great, thank you to those of you who have shared and to all of our veterans, thank you for your service. We are so glad you're joining us today. We hope you know that you're not alone and your Parkinson's community is here with you from near and far. For those of you who are new to the Parkinson's Foundation, welcome. We are the nation's leading community for people with Parkinson's, the people who love them, and all of those who are working to end the disease. With our presence in communities across the country and the globe, we believe in the promise of a cure and a better life for those impacted by PD. The urgency of our mission really translates into what we do. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals, ensuring better care for everyone with Parkinson's, advancing research towards a cure, and educating and empowering the Parkinson's community. We provide free resources, including our website, parkinson.org, educational book series, webinars, a hospital safety kit called Aware and Care, our newly diagnosed materials, and of course, our toll-free helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO. We also have a section of our website dedicated to veterans living with Parkinson's. This includes resources and information about medical care and treatment, veterans benefits, caring for a veteran with Parkinson's, and much more at parkinson.org slash veterans. On the research front, we invest more than $10 million annually to study Parkinson's, what causes it, how to treat it, and ultimately how to cure it. I'd like to highlight PD Generation, which is a Parkinson's Foundation initiative that offers genetic testing and genetic counseling at no cost to people with Parkinson's. Those who are interested in participating can do so in person at select sites across the United States or at home through telemedicine. For more information, you can visit parkinson.org slash PD generation. The Parkinson's Foundation is committed to reaching every person living with Parkinson's. For the estimated 110,000 veterans living with Parkinson's disease, we are so proud to have established a partnership with the US Department of Veterans Affairs with the overall goal to improve the quality of life for veterans and their care partners through greater access to education, resources, and support. We accomplish this by working with the six VA Parkinson's Disease Research, Education, and Clinical Centers, also known as PADREX, in the 51 VA consortium centers across the country. Joining us today from one of those PADREX, we are so thrilled to have Dr. Indu Subramanian here with us today. Dr. Subramanian received her medical degree in 1996 from the University of Toronto, Canada. She did her neurology residency and movement disorders fellowship training at UCLA. Dr. Subramanian has stayed on at UCLA and is now a clinical professor of neurology. She established the movement disorder clinic at the West Los Angeles Veterans Administration and has assumed the position of the director of the Southwest PADRAC Center of Excellence in Parkinson's Disease. She has developed a strong interest in integrative medicine with a special interest in yoga and mindfulness. She underwent a 200 hour yoga teacher training and studied mind mindfulness at the VA with JG Serpa and Christian Wolf through Insight LA. She is designing a yoga teacher training program for yoga instructors who are interested in working with PD patients. Dr. Subramanian recently got board certified in integrative medicine and she is passionate about palliative care and Parkinson's disease. She is also the host of a virtual support group with world experts in PD and co-edits a blog for PD patients. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Subramanian. On that note, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I will go ahead and uh, say hello to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I will try to share my screen as well. Uh, perhaps we'll just um, 
start my PowerPoint presentation, but thanks. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for your service. Um, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to serve our veterans every day and to present to you about our uh, work. It's really a, a work of um, many across the country and um, I'll highlight um, some of our amazing work uh, today. Um, so let me, without further ado, I will go ahead and share my screen here um, and we will, um, sorry, give me one second. Can everyone see that? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Um, not yet still, no. Let me unshare this, give me one second, sorry. How's that? Perfect, and then you just have to, yep, just okay. like, thank Great. you. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity. I'm excited to speak to you about um, an area, a subject area that I've become very passionate about in the last year. And I think you'll understand with the COVID and the pandemic, why it's become such an, an important area of not only study, but also something that's very impactful for each and every one of us living on this earth today. Um, so before I get into that, I just wanted to give everyone a quick overview of Parkinson's disease and um, you know why it's an area that I've been very passionate about um, working uh, and especially around the VA uh, for the last 20 years. So Parkinson's is a very common disease that occurs affects one to two people and a hundred uh, people in the in, in an aging population we're seeing a lot more Parkinson's as the years go by um, in the pandemic um, we've noticed that uh, it's not just a pandemic with COVID, we've actually had a Parkinson's pandemic itself. The caseload in uh, the United States and across the world seems to have doubled in the last 40 years and it's slated to double again in 20 years. So we need a lot of experts um, who are knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about this area and a lot of folks to be working on research and partnerships like this one with the Parkinson Foundation. It's important to emphasize that a lot of people think about Parkinson's disease and they think of um, you know, this older white man uh, that has been portrayed in many of the drawings that we learned about in medical school, but really Parkinson's affects men um, a little bit more than women, but it does affect a number of women. Um, it also affects many age groups. So it's not just as disease of the elderly. We see 20, 30 year olds presenting with Parkinson's. It's important to care about this disease in our veteran population. And I wanted to emphasize that um, it is a disease that is service connected uh, with Agent Orange and Camp Lejeune. We're also interested in learning a little bit more about populations who maybe have had uh, been prisoners of war, traumatic brain injury, and post-traumatic stress disorder, because uh, the sense is that these may put people at a slightly increased risk of having Parkinson's. Um, so Parkinson's is largely thought of as a motor sy syndrome. So we think of things like tremor. It's important to know that not every patient with Parkinson's has tremor. 10 to 15% of patients don't actually have tremor at all. Um, tremor is usually seen at rest. We also have um, stiffness and slowness as part of the presentation. Eventually patients can get balance issues. Usually the symptoms start on one side of the body and then affect the other side. But it's not just a disorder of motor problems. It actually has a lot of impact in the non-motor realm as well. Uh, patients can get a lot of issues with um, affective issues like depression, anxiety. Patients sometimes have a lack of motivation, um, which is otherwise known as apathy. Um, sleep issues are quite common, um, sometimes uh, disorders of thinking with uh, cognition, so memory, things like that can get affected. And sometimes even patients can complain of hallucinations. Um, it's important to realize that Parkinson's disease is um, a disease that affects safety as well. And so in the pandemic, we've largely been worried about our patients um, and have thought of things like the three things that I teach my students are really um, risk of falls can affect how patients do. Um, hallucinations is something that we really need to identify and treat aggressively because it's the number one reason for our patients going to a nursing home. And the third thing that we really try to emphasize from a, a safety perspective is swallow dysfunction. So if we have veterans out there with Parkinson's that are starting to have these issues, it's really important that you um, identify these as problems and bring them to the attention of your, um, of your doctors. 
we ended up um, trying to make a case for why centers of excellence should um, exist. And these were finally put into place about 20 years ago. It's really important to see a specialist with knowledge of Parkinson's because the, no the diagnosis of Parkinson's is actually a clinical diagnosis. There's no one blood test or a scan that we can order that can really make this diagnosis. And so really the more patients that we see as doctors who specialize in this disorder, neurologists who care about this disease, we really are improving the accuracy. And so we have these sorts of specialists available within the VA system. And I'd like to teach you about this and try to get you to connect if you haven't already availed yourself with uh, VA resources. So the way that we really cement the diagnosis of Parkinson's and that we know that a patient actually has 100% certainty of having Parkinson's is actually from looking at the brains of Parkinson's. And so here is a normal brain. This is the midbrain and this black substance, otherwise known as the substantia nigra, is seen here normally um, pigmented well here. And in Parkinson's disease, we lose that substantia nigra. And so this black substance depigments, we start to lose um, this, uh, um, these cells that produce dopamine. And it's really the hallmark of um, this disease is a Lewy body um, that's seen in this pink blob here, which is a protein uh, depositing uh, here, causing this sort of appearance. And this is really how we 100% know that a patient has a diagnosis. Before that, it's really about um, getting a sense from being examined, having a specialist um, take a look at your history, looking at your exam, and then really getting a sense of if you um, respond well to treatment. And so this is why we really think that it's important for patients to see doctors who know about the disease to get the best level of care. So why see a specialist? Well, we really, um, think that we, we love taking care of Parkinson's disease because we think that's a very treatable disorder. Patients have a near normal lifespan. And in the right hands, uh, medically, I think we have really great med medications, surgeries, as well as um, what I'd like to spend a little bit of time teaching you today is about lifestyle changes that you can make to really empower yourself to do better with this disease. So really, it's important to get to a specialist so that you can get accurately diagnosed and get on a good regimen, which would hopefully include the right medications and these right lifestyle changes. So it's education and empowerment is supremely key. And we're really excited about the partnership with the Parkinson Foundation to avail ourselves and allow our veterans to get the level best resources that are possible. And we're working with the Parkinson Foundation to create some of these resources and hold these sorts of events um, to, in, in order to educate and empower our patients. So what are the PADRICs? Um, I think that Sarah spent a little bit of time teaching a little bit about this. So the PADRIC, P-A-D-R-E-C-C, -E stands for the Parkinson's Disease Research Education and Clinical Care Centers. There are six centers of excellence in the country. These are located at West LA, Philadelphia, Richmond, Houston, Portland and Seattle, and then San Francisco. But there's also a network across the country of various centers that also partner with us. And we serve about 110,000 veterans with PD, but it is our great, great pleasure to hope to increase this um, number. And so we really urge you, if you're a veteran with Parkinson's disease that isn't seeking care at the VA, we urge you to give us a try. And we really have this network of a multidisciplinary team, not just with neurologists, but really world-class neurosurgeons, world-class psychiatrists, nurses, researchers, educators, all kinds of folks, social workers, pharmacists, and really excited to partner uh, to help um, with quality of life with veterans with Parkinson's. So the Padricks have access to some exciting medications. We have um, expert pharmacists that are trained in uh, Parkinson's disease treatments. Uh, we can offer pill boxes, help veterans get on a, a good regimen and increase their compliance. We have access to great uh, therapists, physical, occupational, and speech therapists. We have um, access to equipment. Uh, we have access to botulinum toxin, which we use in some of our patients with Parkinson's and deep brain surgery um, equipment uh, to be uh, uh, surgically inserted in the right type of patients uh, who undergo screening at our centers of excellence. We also have access to psychiatry and psychology, and we've really stayed um, in the cutting edge of care um, with VA Video Connect technology. And so with the pandemic, we've kept tried to keep our patients safe by and large, uh, trying to switch to this technology, and many of our centers offer this um, moving forward as well. 
So here you see a map of the United States, and here is my territory in green. I reach out all the way to uh, parts of Texas and up the California coast, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. And um, each of our centers of excellence um, serve uh, a sixth of these um, uh, veterans. And you see here these blue dots that are sister sites uh, throughout the country where we try to educate providers. And so really we're trying to expand our reach um, near and far. We also have an excellent website that I would guide you to. You can get access to this website through uh, the Parkinson Foundation website, um, uh, and it's linked there. But also, if you go directly to our website at www.parkinsons.va.gov, we have a number of resources that are amazing for our veterans, and it tells you there how to get care, um, resources for veterans and families, and also for doctors across the country. And so we have some videos um, on basic uh, stories um, called the My Parkinson Story to teach about these various topics. Um, here. We also have patient education brochures that are um, have been put together by our providers. Here is an example of the exercise and physical activity brochure, which really teaches about the importance of exercise, which we'll learn more about today. Um, here we have um, a number of resources on exercise and also a hospital plan for patients who may need to get elective surgeries and stuff to educate their um, providers. And I know that the uh, Parkinson Foundation also has um, a great uh, um, set of resources for patients who may be hospitalized too. So, so I think we're really working together to do a lot of education and try to give um, the level best um, cutting edge care to our veterans. I wanted to shift now um, to a little bit of a different chat uh, talking a little bit about wellness and empowerment. Um, I have, um, as Sarah mentioned, um, a background in integrative medicine, and I am a Western trained neurologist, um, and I've taken care of Parkinson's patients for the last 20 years. Some of my path has really been looking at um, mindfulness and yoga and trying to see if we can help our patients with Parkinson's uh, with some of these approaches. Um, I'll teach you a little bit about this, but I'm often asked because of that hat that I wear um, about what is wellness. And I wanted to just sort of teach you a little bit about my concepts, and I think it'll tie in nicely with the rest of this program. So wellness is not the opposite of illness. It's, it's sort of this definition that I think is kind of not been very clearly defined historically. I, and I like this definition that's been put forth of wellness as the active pursuit of activities, choices, and lifestyles that lead to a state of holistic health. It's really not just um, you know, the opposite of illness. It's not the absence of disease. The sense is that you're actively pursuing something as a person that you're, you have control over something. There's a conscious, self-directed, and evolving process of achieving your own full potential and really that there's lifestyle choices that you can make to really lead you on this path to more holistic health. And when we talk about health, it's really the sort of fullness of the definition of health um, that I'll teach a little bit about encompassing mental and spiritual well-being and not just physical well-being. So I think it's kind of a cool paradigm shift and, they, and the VA is actually really on the cutting edge of this. So the classic medical paradigm, we think about doing things to feel better. You have a symptom, you have an illness and you try to treat and cure that. And really it's this corrective sort of um, model where you come in as a patient, you come to see me as a doctor, you have this episodic care and I as a clinician take responsibility. There's really this compartmentalized sort of sense that um, the health care model is taken care of in a clinic setting. Um, and really I think we're shifting away from this and we've seen this um, really embodied through the pandemic. And so I'd like to teach you a little bit more about this wellness paradigm that I just um, have talked about. So um, really the sense is it's that we're not just trying to make the patient feel better, we're really hoping to have them thrive, that we're really having this preventative, more holistic approach to care. The patient themselves is taking responsibility. It's really integrated into the core of their life being and that they're really working to maintain and improve health um, and, and getting into an optimal state of well-being. So I think it's really a paradigm shift um, and I'd like to sort of think about this um, as we go through the rest of this talk. So when we talk about wellness, it's really not just uh, uh, exactly the same as well-being or happiness. Um, well-being is sort of um, more of a perception of a state of being and there's this sort of a mental and emotional component Wellness is really related to an intentional sort of sense that we are taking part in an active way to pick um, lifestyle choices as people. And so I think it's, it's kind of an exciting way to sort of think about um, things in a bit of a different sort of setting. 
I think wellness is really important to think about with a cultural context. So wellness for each and every one of us is going to be different depending on where we're living, where we come from, you know, sort of our, our beliefs. And so I was excited when I was putting together this talk to find this graphic um, put together by the First Nations people. And for them, you know, this concept of wellness is really still very centered with the, the patient, the human being in the center um, with these emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical aspects of health around them. But for them, really, you know, the, the sort of concept of wellness has to do with the land, it has to do with these other nations, really thinking about the individual on the planet, um, Earth, and sort of it's, I think it's kind of a really interesting way of thinking about wellness in a different sort of cultural context. So moving into um, a little bit of my background. So um, Sarah told you that I have a board certification in integrative medicine. And what this type of aspect of medicine is really the sort of borderland between classic Western medical approaches that I learned in medical school and this sort of concept of incorporating other things from other healthcare systems, thinking about health and as it was defined in the 1940s as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease in this sort of more holistic lifestyle-oriented approach. And I think it sort of fits very well with that wellness model. And the VA has actually been very much on the cutting edge of this concept. So we have the VA Whole Health. This is the wheel um, that they um, have conce conceptualized. And here you have the patient in the middle um, with uh, this mindful awareness. And then these sort of different things that I'll sort of touch on as things that can influence the patient. And then we have um, these conventional and complementary approaches and prevention and treatment in, in the sort of healthcare model, and then the patient in their community at large. And so really it's the patient in the middle with so many different aspects around them. And so I think it's really important to sort of um, continue to think about this model. And I think the VA has been really open-minded to thinking about this. And actually they, they proposed this, I think like five years ago. And so really many of the rest of healthcare is just now catching up with it. So thinking about that model, one of the things that it talks about is personal development. I like to spend some time teaching my patients about um, thinking about what their purpose is, figuring out what defines health for them, thinking about what brings them meaning and joy. And I think if you can incorporate this and tell your treatment team about this, it can really enhance your ability to get well. Um, exercise is medicine. I'm going to move through these slides relatively quickly because I know we don't have a lot of time and I wanted to spend more time on the social support meaning um, piece, but um, medicine is very, um, exercise is very key to um, doing well with Parkinson's. And I think our second speaker will be speaking to that a little bit um, and embodies that very well. Um, staying mentally active is really important. So finding ways to keep um, connected, keep mentally connected with things that um, bring you meaning. Um, sleep is super key. I think we've really undervalued sleep. Trying to get eight hours a night um, of sleep, if you can, is really um, important for our health. Um, nutrition is very key as part of that wellness wheel. Um, and so in Parkinson's patients, we're really trying to encourage patients to take a Mediterranean diet, eat lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. Hydration is very important. So six to eight glasses of fluids per day, if you can drink water um, or things that are going to hydrate you well. Um, caffeine is actually um, something that can sometimes dehydrate our patients. So really trying to stay well hydrated, drinking water is important. An area that I really um, find a lot of um, wellness around is the mind-body approaches. And so things like yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, these are all things that you actually as veterans have access to at many VAs across the country. Um, if it's an inaccessible to you to start with these sorts of things, um, sometimes just being in nature, going for a walk in nature, um, journaling sometimes, sometimes prayer can be hugely um, helpful to the mind-body approaches. And so I urge you to sort of think about all of these things and what you can do in your day-to-day -day functioning to sort of um, include some of these aspects. In terms of the social connection piece, this is something that I've been very passionate about in the last um, year. Uh, we had done a survey of 1,500 patients with Parkinson's that uh, and has been a longitudinal survey looking at modifiable factors that may influence how patients are doing with their Parkinson's severity and quality of life. We had some of this data going into the pandemic and we ended up getting this published um, last October in Nature Parkinson's. And, um, we had thought about looking at uh, social isolation and loneliness as an issue from some of the integrative medicine meetings that we've been going to. Um, Lori Mishley and I uh, collaborate. She's um, up at Bastyr and is a naturopath um, and has been really holistically looking at modifiable variables 
uh, for what patients can do every day in their lives to um, try to affect their uh, Parkinson's symptoms. And so as part of this research, we looked at um, social isolation we know that in general populations, social isolation is quite uh, deleterious, so it's not good for one's health. Um, social connection is a basic human need, so like just like food, water, and shelter. Um, and uh, in populations at large, we actually know that social isolation is worse than smoking a half a pack of cigarettes a day or being obese. And so it is something that can affect health. Just to define this a little bit, um, social isolation is something that we can um, measure with um, how many people you interact with in your day-to-day -day functioning. Loneliness is a different sort of concept, and this is actually a subjective feeling where there's an undesirable subjective emotional state in which there's a perception of feeling socially isolated. And so it's really this um, sense that we desire relationships in our lives, and then we have relationships that we perceive that we have already. And it's gap, it's this gap between what we desire and what we have that really leads to loneliness. And so as part of my research, I was quite interested in learning more about loneliness. And I found out that in order to be socially connected, you actually need to have three spheres of connection. One is this intimate sphere where you have a close emotional partner or confidant. This may be your spouse. You have a relational sphere of loneliness um, in which you have this longing for close friendships or social companionship. So this may be a few friends that you may meet with um, at a coffee shop once in a while. And then there's a collective loneliness where people feel connected to a network or community of people that is um, that shares their sense of purpose or interest. And for many of our veterans, it's actually being connected to the VA. So I think it's important to realize that one can actually be happily married and still feel lonely if you lack connection in these other spheres. So um, the bottom line of our study is that uh, when we looked at loneliness as a modifiable risk factor, mm -hmm. patients who reported being lonely, it was as bad for them to be lonely as the beneficial effects of exercising seven days a week, 30 minutes a day is good for you. And so as physicians and providers who are trying to help our patients to stay well with Parkinson's, this was really a pretty um, important finding. And what we're realizing is that there may be patients who have a double whammy, who are not exercising, who are um, not socially connected, they may actually do worse. But on the flip side, if you can get exercising and if you can start to get some social connection um, with the help of your providers, I think it can be very meaningful and can actually impact your uh, quality of life in Parkinson's. So with this data going into the pandemic, this was really important for us to sort of be proactive in how we could prevent patients from getting socially isolated, getting more physically inactive, getting stressed out during the pandemic. And there was a notion that with Parkinson's patients, there could be this downward cycle where their symptoms got worse. And so really this um, uh, cartoon was um, uh, illustrated very early in the pandemic as uh, ways that we could keep our patients connected. This was a, um, an illustration of an article written by Boss Blom and uh, Rick Helmick. Um, and the things that they really proposed were online socializing, mindfulness, and exercising at home. And so we've tried to sort of think about this in a proactive way. And, um, you know, we literally had this synergy of pandemics. We had the Parkinson's pandemic that's been increasing cases globally, this loneliness pandemic that was happening even pre-COVID. And then we had COVID-19 as really something that could tip the scales. And I really um, became quite worried about the notion that we had patients who were already socially isolated um, in the pandemic with increasing issues with stress and various issues with in impaired immune function, disrupted sleep, leading to worse motor and non-motor issues, leading to then more social disconnection really in this downward spiral. And so we thought about what could we do to sort of save the day and enter social prescribing, which I'd like to teach you a little bit about. So we really, in our paper, ended up having a call to action to sort of have our doctors think more about these determinants of social health, um, remembering those three spheres of connection, wanted them to learn about social prescribing, um, try to figure out ways to connect um, through the social prescribing, a population at risk for loneliness, for example, with 
resources that may be helpful uh, to benefit um, patients and their symptoms with um, so social support mechanisms. And so we urge people to get vigilant um, and start asking patients about this proactively, and then to use modalities um, such as virtual support groups like this one, and um, also, also possibly proactive phone calls. And so at the VA, we actually have had this exciting new um, program called the Compassionate Contact Core, uh, which uh, allows uh, through a referral from clinicians um, to have uh, lonely veterans be matched with volunteers. Um, both the veteran and volunteer fill out a survey uh, to talk about what um, their interests are, and they try to match um, like-minded uh, veterans with volunteers to really have this proactive way of socially connecting our patients. Um, so it's really kind of an exciting thing. Um, it's available through um, an actual uh, a referral at the VA. Um, it's run by VA Volunteer Services and really um, an exciting new opportunity. And um, if you're a veteran out there and you're lonely, I urge you to ask your um, providers to connect you with the service. And if you're um, a loved one in the community or you'd like to volunteer, um, reach out as well. I think there's lots of volunteer opportunities. So it's really an exciting uh, way to um, stay connected. So again, I urge you to um, think about social connection find ways to find your tribe, find your cheerleader, meet your neighbors. Um, each and every one of us has ways that we can be proactive um, to keep um, all of us socially connected. Um, there's many ways through virtual technology to do Zoom family time. If you're a grandparent, maybe you're reading a book over Zoom. Um, and I've been really thinking about this and embodying this myself. Here's a picture of me with my family over the last um, uh, year. Uh, we've been doing a weekly Zoom and you see here uh, my nephews and my niece and we've just been kind of uh, all disconnected. My parents are uh, socially isolated in um, unfortunately a little bit in, in their community up in Canada um, and they're under lockdown again and so we've just been trying to keep them as connected as possible through the last year. I've also been, um, as Sarah said, running a virtual support group um, so I urge you to look at your community and see what virtual opportunities there may be. We've We've also been trying to keep the Parkinson's community um, connected through a blog that we've been writing. Um, Michael Oken and I have been writing a blog at parkinsonsecrets.com. And just also just a shout out to our uh, caregivers out there as well. I think that, you know, we see you, we know that this has been a tough year for you. Many of you have been isolated at home with your loved one. And so it's really important to take a moment to really think about your own self-care, make sure you're seeing doctors, make sure you're taking care of yourselves because if something happens to you as our caregivers, we really then don't have anyone to care for our patients. So that oxygen um, sort of analogy of having the oxygen mask on a plane, putting that oxygen mask on you first as a caregiver um, before you help um, our patients is really you know important. So important to think about self-care for all, and also for everyone out there, I think that it's been a rough year. I just want to acknowledge that. And we really appreciate, um, you know, all the service that our veterans have given uh, for our country, as well as, you know, our caregivers who are taking care of our veterans out there. So we want to think about, you know, this year and the continuation of the time moving forward as really a marathon and not a sprint. So we want to take care of ourselves. If we need a break, get, get a break ask for help if you need it, give yourself permission to not be perfect. I think I've had to let a lot of things go as I've been trying to, you know, balance being a mom and a doctor and, uh, you know, um, someone who's giving support to my patients as well as my aging parents, just a lot of balancing. So be kind to yourself. It's been a lot of different emotions that we've gone through. I, I put together this graphic about a year ago um, at the beginning of the pandemic, thinking about all the different emotions that we've really had to go through. And I think it's just so important to realize that, you know, even as there have been a lot of negative things that have happened, many of us have come together. We have a lot of hope for the future. And so urging all of our patients out there to stay connected be proactive and get vaccinated if you're offered it as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Subramanian. We'll actually keep you on screen since we have a couple minutes left for your section to just answer a few questions before our formal, formal Q&A at the end. Um, so we had somebody write in and say, I've heard that exercise and mindfulness can change the brain. Can you tell me a little bit about how yoga helps with Parkinson's beyond the physical? Yeah, so yoga, um, 
Yoga is interesting because I think it's gotten a bit of a over commercialized sense that it's for um, very flexible ballerinas who are, you know, young women um, wearing cute yoga pants. But really, yoga is an age old tra tradition. You know, it's thousands of years old. It's part of this umbrella of um, of uh, Ayurveda, and it's really sort of uh, embodies is sort of almost a way of life. So there's three aspects to yoga. Um, it's not just sort of this exercise or the poses. Um, it actually has a meditation component as well as a breathing component. I think all three of those are actually very important to discuss, you know, when we're talking about the benefits of yoga. The mindfulness or meditation component is important. It actually can help with sleep. It can help with cognition. It can help with um, our mood. There's a lot of um, benefits to um, the meditative aspects. And I think, you know, when we talk about mindfulness as a separate thing, yoga actually incorporates that when we're using, um, you know, our, the brain and, and connecting with the body um, and being present, uh, you know, in many aspects of yoga. The second area that I think is really unique to yoga is actually the breath work. And there, this is very different than I think um, um, a lot of other practices. And it's really exciting to me as a Parkinson's doctor to think about breath work, um, this pranayama, they call it, which is really sort of um, emphasizing breathing techniques, which can really um, tap into the autonomic nervous system very powerfully. So um, that's that fight and flight response kind of that we have um, that can lead to sometimes anxiety, sometimes freezing, sometimes can lead to um, sleep disruption and things like that. Breath work in yoga can actually tap into that very, very powerfully and can reset sometimes actually uh, the heart rate can reset um, the blood pressure uh, sort of things. And, and it's actually a very powerful practice. And then we have, you know, the, what we call asanas or the poses, which I think in Parkinson's is very beneficial. It can actually have the stretching component. If you get stiff and slow, it can tap into um, that. It can affect balance. So you can actually practice balance um, quite in beautifully. You can modify the poses. So sometimes you can practice in a, in a chair, you can practice on the floor, depending on the stage, you can really mix it up. So I think it has a huge amount of really interesting sort of applications. You can actually get your heart rate up uh, pretty well as well. So I think that, you know, from a cardio perspective, you, you can actually have that as well. But I think I've, I am a bit biased when I talk about yoga because I, I, I practice it myself and I, I just think it's a very powerful sort of uh, thing. Yes, absolutely. And you mentioned all those emotions we've experienced last year. The breath work has definitely come in handy when it comes to regulating those feelings. So thank you again, Dr. Subramanian. Um, she will be back at the end of the presentation for a few more Q&A. So if you guys have questions, feel free to continue to submit those through the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. So thank you again, Dr. Subramanian. Next up, we will have our next speaker join us, Michael Myers. Michael is a veteran, a certified Rock City boxing coach, and a person living with Parkinson's. He's joining us today from Mesa, Arizona, and will be sharing his Parkinson's story with us and talking about how he became an empowered member of the community. Michael, I'll turn it over to you so you can briefly introduce yourself and share a little bit about your time in the military. Thank you, Sarah. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Subramanian uh, so much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I was uh, uh, taking notes through the whole thing. As, as I, you mentioned, I do have uh, P Parkinson's and uh, I, I got some uh, really uh, good ideas and things that I want to follow through with uh, from her presentation. So thank you very much for that, doctor. Um, I, I am going to uh, share with you uh, a little bit about my journey with uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, and uh, uh, Sarah asked me to just mention that uh, I, I am uh, a Marine, a Marine, uh, I joined in uh, uh, November 5th, 1967, and got out in uh, February of 1971. Uh, probably nothing, uh, nothing too special about it, any any different than most of your experiences. Uh, and um, I would also like uh, to thank all of you uh, veterans for your service. Uh, uh, everybody, even other veterans, appreciates appreciate you very much. Uh, I was um, uh, I was in for three and a half years and uh, uh, actually started out in the reserves, but I got activated uh, to active duty, and then uh, uh, that, that, that's that's probably really 
it doesn't get any more interesting than that. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing and thank you for your service to our country. Um, so let's fast forward a bit to 2017, which is when you received your diagnosis. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, how could I forget? <laughs> uh, I was uh, uh, probably like most of you uh, folks out there, uh, I was experiencing uh, different symptoms and uh, really knew nothing about Parkinson's disease and uh, was quite surprised when that ended up being my diagnosis. I, I thought that uh, from some of the tests that I was having that I actually had uh, uh, serious heart issues. And uh, it took about three months before I was finally sent to a neurologist who uh, did a, uh, some more tests and, uh, and uh, presented me with the diagnosis that, that, that I had uh, Parkinson's disease. And, and like the doctor said a few minutes ago, it, it really wasn't any specific blood test or anything like that that said you do or don't have Parkinson's disease. It was mostly the time in clinic, uh, the observations. And uh, when, when uh, then he, he made a decision to uh, try me on a medication for uh, he's, he's to take this medication for X number of days and then come back. And I did, and the medication helped a lot. So uh, that's when I got the final diagnosis. He said, I'm really sorry to tell you, but you have Parkinson's disease. And all I could think of to say was, isn't that what Michael J. Fox has? And he said, yes, it is. And uh, the, the rest of it was just, you know, because I really didn't know anything about it. So we started out on a, on a, a medication program uh, that, that really helped. And, and he had uh, advised me to keep moving. And be, before this diagnosis, I was very, very active, uh, uh, both in uh, all different kinds of exercise and swimming and et cetera. And uh, I really didn't, uh, not knowing anything about Parkinson's, I really didn't know how to feel. And uh, my wife, uh, when we got home from that uh, appointment, she immediately started uh, reading about Parkinson's disease and was, uh, was uh, very supportive. Uh, and, and she did all the research. I, I really, I, I just really didn't. Uh, uh, and she would come to me and say, well, read this or I would say, well, why don't you read it to me? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we, we formed a team and, and uh, uh, I have to thank her for, you know, all of her, all of her care, support. She's my caregiver, but I don't really need what, when people think about a caregiver, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty self-sufficient, uh, uh, unless I fall down. <laughs> which uh, is one of my symptoms. Now I am a fall risk. I walk with a cane and, uh, and I, I do fall. I fortunately have not seriously hurt myself in any of my falls. And uh, I did figure out that the only time that I fall is when I'm not using my cane. So I now use my cane all the time. So uh, that is, as far as my diagnosis goes, um, that, was, that was really uh, pretty much it. It, it, was, uh, it was stunning to me because like I said, now that I know so much about it, this has been over four years ago now, I'm in my fifth year and uh, I've had issues, uh, but I do all the things, especially a lot of the things that the Dr. Subramanian talked about. I, I do all of these things to slow down the progression of the symptoms. And it's just one of the most important things that you can do. And I would like to say, uh, before we switch gears, that I, I, the things that I'm going to talk to you about today will, will let you know that it is possible to live a quality life with Parkinson's disease. I'm living proof of that. And it's not that, that it's easy for me or that I don't have any issues, because I do, I have all the symptoms everybody else has. 
and uh, but I fight. I and I you you never can you can't stop fighting, and and a lot of that is attitude, which I'll I'll get into in the next in the next section. But as far yeah. as my diagnosis, that that was pretty much it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. We know how important it is from Dr. Subrianian to have that partner in your life who's able to help you with the things that you need help with and to be there for you. And I think you had a great quote one time. You said, she's my partner in care, not my care partner. And I thought that was a great philosophy. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we'll jump into the next question. So after being diagnosed, you met Robin, our development manager, who encouraged you to sign up for our 5K. Can you tell us what it meant to you to participate in Moving Day? Uh, yes, I can. <laughs> Uh, I, I met Robin uh, quite by accident, uh, uh, and what a wonderful person she is, uh, and uh, she's, uh, like Sarah said, she's with the uh, Parkinson's Foundation, uh, and um, we met, and uh, we, we talked, and she said that she was very interested in hearing more about my, my story, which I call my journey, and uh, she told me that there was a... Uh, Move, moving day coming up, which is a 5K. Now, I at that point, I, I couldn't, this is probably two, three months after my diagnosis. Uh, and I was at this stage of, uh, oh, I got Parkinson's. I, 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 I don't even think I could drive a 5K. So, so uh, she said, you don't have to run uh, this 5K, you can walk. You, you don't have to finish, you can just start. So somehow she talked me into doing this and I told my wife about it and she said, I'll go too, we'll both do it. So we signed up and we, we show up out there and, and there's this uh, huge crowd of people out there uh, to do this 5K. And a, an awful lot of them work for the Parkinson's Foundation. And then there was a lot of volunteers that were you know, this is where you go to do this and you get your t-shirt here. And anyway, it was, and then we, it was time to start and we all went to the starting line and I've got my cane and uh, uh, off we go to do this 5K. And I told Karen when we started, I said, my goal today is to finish. I don't care if we come across this finish line at eight o'clock tonight, I just want to finish. And then, oh, I don't know, about 20 minutes into it, I thought, I, I, I couldn't turn around to, there's a lot of people in front of us, but I couldn't turn around to see how many were behind us because I thought I would lose my balance and fall over. So I asked her, how, how many people are behind us or is anybody behind us? And she said, oh, there's a lot of people back there. And I said, new goal. Now, uh, I don't wanna be last. <laughs> I don't want to cross the finish line at eight o'clock tonight. So we just kept going and, and uh, only stopped a couple of times to get cups of water. And we finished it in one hour, literally on, on the money, one hour. And when we crossed that finish line, there were all these volunteers and everybody was applauding and cheering. And they gave us these uh, gold medals that they put around our necks. And, and uh, I realized that I, I was excited. I mean, this was like, uh, uh, I accomplished something that I, I never imagined that I would ever be able to do anything like that. And uh, not only did I do it, and, and, and Karen too, but I did it in an hour. And there was a lot of people, we, we were mid pack. There was a, a lot of people behind us. So I was probably more excited about that than anything. And, uh, uh, it, it was just, uh, and then I, I, I hooked up with, uh, Robin afterwards and, and we just, you know, it was just so exciting. And so the energy, it, it, it was, I, and I've done two more since then, uh, and it, it's just been, uh, 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 the Parkinson's foundation, uh, has been such a great resource in addition to move day, uh, as far as uh, if, if there's anything I need or need to know about or can't find information on, 
called the Parkinson's Foundation. And the interesting thing is, folks, that's what they're there for, is just to serve, to help us in any way that they can. And uh, they're all very, very nice people. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful organization. Definitely. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing that. I know we learned from Dr. Subramanian that movement is medicine. So I'm sure with everyone out there at Moving Day, that helped you a lot. So we're glad to hear that you accomplished that and that you finished in an hour. That is great. So, um, Michael, the next question, um, let's talk about rock steady boxing. So you're a huge proponent of boxing and now a certified rock steady boxing coach. Can you tell us how you got involved and then eventually became a coach? Yes. Um, again, uh, my wife, Karen, uh, approached me one day and she said, I think I found something that might be good for us. And I love the way that she says for us. Uh, and I asked her what it was and she told me rock steady boxing. And I said, well, you know, I, I might be able to do a 5k, but I certainly can't box. So anyway, I, I called the, uh, the place and asked if I could come observe. And, uh, they said, of course, I said, I, I have Parkinson's and I read about your program and I'm interested in just checking it out. So I went and, uh, this was the first time when I went to this boxing gym that I'd ever actually seen somebody in person with Parkinson's disease that I know of. I, I'd never met anybody with Parkinson's disease before. So we went in and, and uh, introduced ourselves and we got seated. And uh, there was probably a dozen people in there with, that were, and they were all very advanced in their Parkinson's disease. But you have to remember that they'd had it so long, they didn't have programs like this that many years ago. So uh, I stayed there probably for five minutes and I got up and walked out and Karen followed me out and we went to the car and she said, I'll never forget these words. She said, that is so unlike you, what happened? What's wrong? And I said, I sat there for those few minutes and all I could see was me. But when? Is it going to be six months from now, two years from now? But I knew that was the first time I'd had a snapshot of my future. And uh, it, two, two strong emotions happened. It broke my heart and it scared me to death. So she said to me, Karen, that she, probably the most amazing thing that she's ever said to me she said what if you do this and you don't get like that N never crossed my mind so the bottom line is I signed up the next week and I've been going to rock steady boxing for four years now three times a week uh, and uh, it it is not contact boxing they, they have they have discovered that the exercises that boxers do can can slow down the progression of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And I'm living proof of that. I'm in my fifth year now of diagnoses and uh, I'm still hitting the bags as hard as I was four, four years ago. And uh, I noticed after the 5K and then after a couple of months of uh, the rock steady boxing, I had this feeling that I hadn't recognized in a while. And it was hope. I had become hopeful that maybe Karen was right when she said in the car, what if you do this and you don't get like that? So uh, after maybe a, a year, I, I, I thought, you know, I feel good. And I, I felt like, maybe there's something I could do to, to give back to rock steady boxing or to the Parkinson's foundation. And, and, uh, so they, they have this, uh, certification program. It's an eight week program and, uh, it's kind of expensive, but I, I told my wife, I was going to do this to surprise my affiliate. That's the lady that owns the rock steady boxing. It's like a franchise. And she said, I don't think you should do that because what if she doesn't want to 
coach. <laughs> I said, well, I, you're probably right. So I went to her and I talked to her. Her name is Nikkel. Wonderful, wonderful person who, who is really responsible for me having this opportunity. And I told her that I was interested in getting certified to coach. I felt like I had something to offer. And she said, I would love for you to get certified to coach. So anyway, to skip a couple of steps, I did. And I shadowed her for a few classes and then I, I started coaching. And now I'm, I'm still coaching uh, today, uh, uh, depending on, on, on the schedule and everything. The pandemic has slowed us down a little bit as well, but I'm still coaching uh, pretty regularly. And I've learned since then that all the exercising that I do gives me hope, but the coaching and giving back gives me purpose. And that to me is whether you have Parkinson's or not, if you can have hope and purpose in your life, you're way ahead of the game. So I feel, you know, while I would rather not have Parkinson's, at least I have hope and purpose. And uh, uh, one of the things that I kind of liken this to uh, being in the service, and, and a lot of you folks out there will recognize this. One of the, the greatest things about being in an organization like Rocksteady Boxing or, or any, any uh, coordinated uh, exercise program the Parkinson's Foundation, uh, you know, it's this idea of, uh, of a community, uh, of a camaraderie, a t teamwork. Uh, Karen and I are a team, but I'm now I'm a team with all these other boxers and uh, their caregivers or their spouses or wh whatever. And uh, uh, this, this camaraderie is... Uh, I ask sometimes when I'm coaching, we, we have a, at the end of each uh, uh, session, we have a little Q and A, you know, and I'll say sometimes, what's your favorite part about Rocksteady Boxing? And all of them without hesitation will say the camaraderie. And I say, what do you mean by that? And it's, we all understand how each other feels because we all have the same stupid disease and we can talk about it. You know, I might not talk about it to the guy that lives three doors down that I say hi to when I'm walking down the street, but it's very comforting to talk to people that are part of your team. And uh, we, some of, we've become very close friends and, and it's, uh, it's uh, we can share anything uh, about this disease with each other and it helps, it makes a difference. So w one of the things, that I would encourage you to do is find somebody to talk to, whether it's your spouse or a professional or, or a close, close friend, and also find somebody to talk to that has Parkinson's disease because they really understand. And, and there's a lot of, a, a lot that happens with that in those interactions. And, uh, uh, I, I can't stress that enough is, in fact, I had written down here to ask you all a question, who do you talk to, you know? And if you don't have an answer to that question, find somebody to talk to, it's just, it's critical. Uh, uh, and, and again, back to the rock steady boxing, it does slow down the progression of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which is, which is ho hopefully in four more years, Hopefully I'll, I'll be asked back here again, maybe sometime to have this conversation with another group and I'll say the same thing, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, four years, I'm hoping. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's great that you have found hope, you found a purpose, you found the com camaraderie in rock steady boxing. Um, we know how important the camaraderie is for our veterans community. So what would you tell somebody who may be weary of boxing? Well, uh, Sarah, that's an easy question to answer. Um, if, if it's not, don't look at it as boxing, quote unquote, because you're not really boxing. You're, you're, uh, you're, we do the exercises, we punch the bags, not each other. 
And, but there's other things involved in that, such as we work on a lot of cognitive things and a lot of fine motor skill things uh, that we do. We have different stations that we go through that change every class. Uh, and some of them involve doing little things with our hands and, and some of them involve, for example, uh, you're punching a bag to a certain, certain count and at the same time you're naming vegetables out loud. And you would be amazed at how many people can, can punch the bag and only name three vegetables, you know, in a minute. Or we'll, we do things where we, we, we throw these uh, light uh, balls back and forth and you have to name cities. You'd be surprised with eight or 10 people in a circle can only name five cities. You know, it's because of, it's be, so this helps with the cognition part of it too. Uh, and it, it's, it's so important. Um, I, I, I guess I could say uh, the, with the Parkinson's Foundation and Rock City Boxing, and I do other exercises too. I, I swim every day. Um, I used to go to the gym every day and ride the recumbent bike for five to 10 miles, but I haven't gone back to the gym yet because I'm nervous still about the, the pandemic. It, it, the gyms, they're not enforcing all the rules and, and I'm a little nervous about that and I'm not willing to risk it yet. But I, I, would, have to, I would have to say that uh, the Rocksteady Boxing and the uh, Parkinson's Foundation have literally changed my life. Well, that's great, Michael. We are here to help you and we're happy to help you. So when it comes to being an empowered member of the Parkinson's community, what would you recommend to your fellow veterans living with Parkinson's? Uh, I, I would I would recommend kind of the few things that I just said. First of all, um, get involved, get off your couch, and get out and do something. I I know people, literally know people that sit on the couch all day. Oh, I've got Parkinson's disease, and I can't. I you go get the mail, honey. I can't walk to the mailbox. You know, I mean people that, uh, and I, I, I'm not criticizing, it's, it, and it can be depressing, but I think that if we have the right attitude that we can control those feelings, if you start feeling depressed, I guarantee you, if you start moving, get up and go get the mail or walk around the block, take the dog for a walk, whatever, uh, uh, do a crossword puzzle, uh, you will feel better. And I, I think that we have the ability to control those feelings uh, of, of depression. And I mean, and sometimes it might include medicine. I mean, I, I take more medicine now than I imagined I would ever take in my life, but it's all, it's all you, you know, uh, um, what I need for, for my Parkinson's and it helps, it helps. Uh, so I, I would say uh, get involved, get into a community. If you don't, if you can't think of, of one, call the Parkinson's Foundation right away. Ask your neurologist right away. What, 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 ha, ask him, have you ever heard of Rock City Boxing or some exercise program that I could get into and, and, and do it? Uh, look up a rock steady boxing in your area, wherever you live. I, I've, I noticed that we have people from all over the country here today and uh, check it out. It's free. I mean, to check it out. It's not, it's not free, but, but, uh, and every, every coach there is certified. Uh, and if, if it's, and if that's absolutely not for you, you don't want to do that kind of exercise, get into some kind of exercise program preferably with other people because then you get the camaraderie and the team spirit and you know you can you, you eat everybody grows off of everybody else and it's it's a uh, it's fun it's fun uh yeah. and, and and that when you know it's hard to believe that you can have parkinson's disease and you can't walk across the room without maybe falling over but you can still have fun I'll say again, you can have a quality life with Parkinson's disease. 
Yes, that is a great philosophy. You thank you, Michael. Um, we know between the Parkinson's Foundation and the VA, there are resources available to help veterans with Parkinson's stay connected and live better lives. So whether it's joining a program like this one, attending a veteran support group through the VA, or chatting with the people in your Rock City boxing class, it is so important to stay connected and keep moving. So thank you again, Michael. Hopefully with the advice from you and Dr. Subramanian, our community is feeling a little bit more empowered than they were before this call. So at this time, we're gonna bring Dr. Subramanian back. We've received some great questions from our audience. So we're gonna jump into those. Feel free to continue submitting questions through the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So to get into the questions, Dr. Subramanian, we'll start with you. Um, it says, I love the slide and the information about the wellness paradigm shift. How can we as patients find doctors with this, with this outlook? Is there a type of training, certification, et cetera, that we can look for? Um, so we're trying to educate doctors more, and uh, I think we're starting to move the envelope. I think that COVID uh, pandemic has really opened our eyes to how important I think the lifestyle piece is and how important it is to think about not just the patient and their symptom as a person with a disease and you know a tremor, but really thinking about all the sort of variables that are back in the in this sort of context of you know what their skin color is, what their sex, gender, you know, age, many many things, you know, their 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 sexual preference, all these things can make a difference in how people are able to access the healthcare system, how um, you know what what type of uh, symptoms they end up having, and and how well they do. And so I think we have to you know really think about the diversity as something that can. Um, make a difference for how, how our patients are doing. So I, I do think that sort of thinking about not just the person and, and the symptom has, has, has hopefully been a thing of the past. I think our new generations of medical students are also eager to learn about a different way and are driving sort of um, the, the conversation and the type of teaching that we're giving them in a different way as well. But it has to start with, um, you know, more patients coming in and saying, you know, what about these resources? And what do you think about, um, you know, exercise as medicine? And, and um, you know, over the last year, I've been doing this virtual support group and, and interviewing all kinds of people of all walks of life and all kinds of, um, you know, really uh, subspecialty researchers and world-class leaders in Parkinson's. But the thing that I've been asking them uh, sort of is, you know, what do you think is a secret sauce to helping patients do well? And what really makes a difference from a lifestyle, lifestyle perspective? It doesn't matter if they were presenting on, you know, uh, protein deposition in a cell or something very, you know, sort of, um, you know, basic science. And literally everybody who's coming on, um, who's had any exposure to Parkinson's patients at all, really sort of resonates uh, and, and amplifies sort of the message that you just heard from, from Michael about, you know, sort of your mental attitude. So, you know, thinking about hope, thinking about finding a purpose, thinking about what brings you meaning and, you know, incorporating that in your day-to-day, -day, sort of these sorts of things. I think it doesn't matter who they believe that sort of that the positive mental attitude and, and then empowering patients. So if, when patients feel like they have control over something, then they do better. So it doesn't matter who people are. I think at the core, people do believe that. And I think we've made a shift and finally convinced people that exercise is medicine too in our, in our field, in this disease state. So I think those things are pretty much I think a given. And so I would sort of start to approach your, your docs and find out about that. Some of the other stuff, I think nutrition has become more in, in, in the mix. I think people, as they've lived through the pandemic and have been eating junk food and not sleeping well and not exercising and been off their game from a, a schedule uh, perspective have themselves been feeling bad. I think many of my colleagues have been trying to figure out how we can, you know, stay well um, in the pandemic. So I think as we're emerging from this, I'm really hopeful that some of the um, sort of uh, the things that we've learned won't be forgotten. So caring about diversity, caring about, you know, people of, you know, everyone out there in our communities, because, you know, sort of being a little bit more connected to each other um, globally and in our neighborhoods and caring about, you know, everyone who isn't getting the care. I think this has been something that is, is come out of this pandemic, but also I think thinking about these lifestyle things as something that we can really um, keep 
uh, as part of um, the mainstay and in the forefront of our minds uh, to really influence health and how patients are doing and people are doing um, on this world, hopefully it will also stay in our forefront because I think there has been more of an emphasis of these things, um, you know, through the last year and a half. So, so I'm hoping that this sort of stuff will, will, will sort of win. And I think, you know, if you're seeing a provider and you're coming up with these sorts of thoughts and you're just getting shut down or you're, you're not getting the right answers, I think, you know, you have choices, you know, maybe finding a different provider, uh, maybe going to an organization um, like the Parkinson Foundation or even the VA and sort of having discussions with other patients and support groups, I think can also be helpful because if, um, you know, I think as more people have communicated well, perhaps taking resources in, um, I know that the Parkinson Foundation has certain um, questionnaires that you can check off and things are frequently asked questions. And, and I think sometimes it, it may be the approach to the provider saying, hey, I, I found this on the Parkinson Foundation website, you know, and I thought number three was a good idea. What do you think? And, and sort of having that discussion. So I think open communication is definitely helpful too. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so Michael, we had somebody who asked, can I box if I cannot walk? I use a wheelchair for movement. Good question. And uh, the answer to that is absolutely. Uh, we have class people uh, like me and we have classes for people with crutches, walkers, wheelchairs, uh, and uh, you, you can do, uh, every exercise we do can be modified for what, depending on the person's situation. Uh, we've, we have people that sit in wheelchairs and we wheel them up to the, to the for example, of the punching bag and, and they punch it. Uh, and and uh, there's lots of other exercises that, and we make modifications and, and uh, they love it. They, they, they do. So yet the answer to that question is yes. Great, that's fantastic, thank you. So Dr. Subramanian, we had somebody write in and say, mindfulness is intimidating to me. How can I get started? Yeah, I mean, I think again, the sort of global sense of some of these things like yoga and even boxing, I think people have like these sort of ideas in their mind. And I think sometimes we have to just sort of open our minds a little bit. So mindfulness is one of those things where I think, you know, there's a sense that you're, you need a lot of time, you need to, you know, go to a retreat and pay a lot of money and um, have a completely quiet space in your home with a whole, you know, setup to be able to do this for, you know, hours at a time. Um, you know, my sense of mindfulness is sort of just um, paying sort of attention, uh, being present, um, you know, non-judgmentally sort of, you know, and, and, and I think you can do this in many, many ways. And I think people don't realize that maybe they're doing some mindfulness throughout their day without really the, the sort of um, definition, uh, textbook definition that they sort of may think it, it sort of applies to. So, so for me, um, you know, I think that I, nature has been a real source of uh, being present for me um, during the pandemic. I've spent a lot of time just going to the beach and watching the waves and just sort of smelling the, the sea breeze and feeling, you know, the sand on my feet and, you know, the sort of five senses. That's a very easy sort of place to start. So, you know, getting out maybe in your garden, maybe you don't live by the beach, but, you know, standing on the grass with your feet, feeling the sensation of the grass, um, maybe feeling, hearing the birds, um, smelling, you know, whatever it is. If you don't have uh, flowers, you know, maybe the, the pine needles, needles, um, you know, seeing, you know, what's growing in the garden. There's, there's many, many senses, you know, maybe tasting uh, a mint leaf that you, you may be growing, you know, so there's these five sense walks that you can do that are actually, you know, free essentially, and you can still connect with nature, be present, um, be in your mind sort of, and, and sort of just take time away from just all the craziness that has really been bombarding us with, um, you know, the social media, the sort of news on bad news all the time. And so I think sometimes when you can just sort of take time and unwind, you really can sort of be a little bit more, um, you know, sort of at peace. And I think find those moments. And, and I think, you know, each and every one of us, even if you're a caregiver, for example, and you're, you know, in your home, I think I urge people to take even 10 minutes for yourself and just do something like that. And in, 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 you know, mindfulness can be even, um, you know, listening to a song that really brings you, um, 
meaning or joy, uh, some, you know, some sort of uh, activity like um, writing in a journal, three things that you're uh, grateful for, um, you know, these, these little things that I think we kind of forget um, that can be so important and, or even, you know, what are you hopeful for? What do you hope to do next year? What are you looking forward to? You know, journaling can be, you know, great. So I think these little subtle practices can be, you know, hugely impactful and, and I think an entry uh, to the world of mindfulness. And then there's apps and other things if people are interested. And actually we have some of the most uh, fabulous world-class mindfulness teachers on the planet that work at the VA and they've designed some great um, things that are available on the whole help uh, website. And uh, I urge you to look at some of those resources too. Because I think you know they they found that some of these practices can actually impact our veterans uh, tremendously, and many veterans are actually very open to trying and have benefited a lot, even with you know complex depression, anxiety, post traumatic stress disorder. Um, this work is being done at our VAs and 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 showing benefits even in our population. So that's fantastic. I love that tidbit about getting out in nature. I think for the three of us, we're fortunate to be in the Southwest and have been able to get outside and enjoy nature and take in those moments. So hopefully for the rest of you with spring and summer approaching, you are able to do the same. Um, so Michael, we have a question for you. It says, I refuse to accept the diagnosis the first year and I have had Parkinson's for 13 years and I am 64. What helped you finally accept your diagnosis? Good question. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm a realist, and I, I once I once I learned more about what Parkinson's disease is, and uh, 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 then it became a a challenge for me to uh, to not give into it, and and I think that that was very helpful. And I, I think that the question you asked, and, and the word is acceptance. You have to accept it. I mean, it is what it is. And and then you look at ways to uh, move on with it. Uh, it's like Dr. Subramanian said, uh, there's all different kinds of things, you know, the yoga and all, all the other things that she talked about that, and the attitude that, that will help you live a quality life with Parkinson's disease. I mean, I keep saying that, but that's how I feel. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's not easy. I, I mean, I'm not saying that it's easy. You have to fight for it. And, and that's where the attitude comes in and uh, try different things. Uh, and one, one thing that uh, I, I forgot to mention a couple of minutes ago was um, try and be an inspiration to somebody else you must know somebody that's had Parkinson's less time than you have. Try, try and be an inspiration for them. And uh, not only does that make you feel better, but you're, you're helping somebody else too. And that's always good for, you know, uh, getting past the acceptance stage of your diagnosis, I think. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Michael. So Michael, what would you say, having spent time in the Marine Corps and learning those lifelong skills and tools, what has helped you the most now when it comes to living well with Parkinson's? I, th I think, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know you were gonna ask me this question, but I, I think that uh, that feeling that you get as a, uh, in, in, when you're in the service you, you develop a feeling of, if I can do this, I can do anything. I've actually carried that with me. I, it was 50 something years ago, I was in the Marine Corps and I've, I've carried that with me. It, it, it's, been, it's, it's helped my attitude throughout my life. I mean, when I've lost a loved one or, or uh, anything, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, you, get, you ha just have this feeling that if I could do that, I, I can certainly do whatever else comes down the road. And Parkinson's disease is no different. It's just something that came down the road. And uh, I can do this. You can do this. That is a great mantra. Thank you, Michael. 
Um, so Dr. Subramanian, somebody asked um, or mentioned you spoke about wellness, but what does that actually mean? And what kind of things can I do every day to change how I feel? Uh, yeah, so I, I think that it has been, again, the branding of many of these things has been, you know, not uh, great. I actually spoke to a colleague who, um, you know, I was talking about wellness as, uh, you know, sort of something that I really wanted to try to define better and help patients to understand that they are part of, they are at the driver's seat of that wellness. It's really this, um, as I as I said, it's a sort of active choice that one makes on a day-to-day -day basis in their lifestyle to really get a sense that they are, you know, in control of this pathway that they're on to thriving. So it's not just, I have a symptom, I want to take that symptom away, or I have a cold and I'm going to, you know, be over it in two days or whatever. It's a sort of holistic kind of picture of somebody who is, and when we think about health again, it's not just, you know, a physical symptom that's obvious, like I'm, you know, uh, stiff on the side and I want to, you know, take a medicine to make it better. It's really thinking about, you know, that person in the context of where they're living, how they're thriving in their community and their family day to day with their quality of life life and what makes them sort of define health, which may be playing with their grandchildren. Maybe for Michael, it's collecting the motorcycles that are behind him or, or the rock steady boxing coaching or, or being, you know, a better husband to his wife or whatever, <laughs> being able to take her, you know, out. Um, you know, so I think, you know, all of these things are very, very individual and very different. So I think it's really about this more holistic picture. So that's sort of how I define wellness as a sort of proactive sort of choices that a person feels like they're in control of making. And, and that sort of attitude that I am in control can then hopefully make you thrive and, and sort of a different way of thinking. So what are the things that you can do on a day-to-day basis to impact that? Well, sleeping. So sleep is so important. Many of us have been sold this idea that we should sleep when we're dead and multitasking and trying to get as much out of every day and, you know, um, go, 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 go. Well, actually sleep is when you cement your memories and it's when you clear all your toxins. And I like to tell people it's like floss for your brain. So it's like getting rid of all the junk. So if you're not sleeping well with Parkinson's, then you're really going to have, you know, not a good day the next day. And people notice that all the time. So getting a good night's sleep, eight hours, if you can, if you need more, go for it. Um, eating right. So if you eat a bunch of junk all day, you're not going to feel so good. Your blood sugar is going to be up and down. We know that, you know, patients with Parkinson's probably do better with the Mediterranean diet, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. It helps your gut, you know, um, with more fiber to digest your food and, and really sort of those nutrients are important for brain health as well. Um, you know, the exercise we've talked about is like medicine. So, you know, study after study, it doesn't matter what exercise you do. If you're doing it consistently, if we can get 30 minutes, five days a week, um, you know, some cardio, um, it's really, you know, going to help with so many of the things that we talked about. So if you can pick something and it doesn't have to be what Michael picks, maybe, um, you know, the boxing for me, it might be yoga for somebody else. It might be Tai Chi, or it might be going for a walk with a friend, you know, in the Hills behind your house. Um, you know, everyone's very different swimming, you know, you you pick it, think about what really you enjoy doing. And if you like doing it, you're going to look forward to it. And if you can pick a friend to do it with, you're going to be having somebody to give you that social connection. That's going to keep you showing up. It's going to help you with your apathy. It's going to keep you sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of want, looking forward to seeing that person, especially if there's somebody that you, you enjoy seeing the social connection we talked about, and that's huge. We have never really spent as much time talking about social connection in this year when people have literally lacked human connection human touch, human smiles, we see how badly it's affected each and every one of us. And we've been, you know, our heart hurts when you don't get to see people. And luckily for some of our patients, you know, they have a wife that's loving, that's inspiring them. But a lot of my veterans have nobody, literally they have me checking in on them. So it's been heartbreaking to not be able to see them. We've been seeing them on video and seeing a decline because they haven't been connected. And so find a way to connect. And if, if you're good and you're connected, find somebody who isn't connected. And, you know, I'm, I, I urge you to pick up your Christmas card list. And I've been talking about this to anyone I will, you know, that will listen to me. Um, you know, that neighbor that is quiet down the street, maybe they're isolated. They're just waiting for human connection. So do something, be proactive, find a phone list, maybe in, in your support group or your boxing group of 10 people that couldn't make it because they didn't have transportation, call them. Hey, how are you doing? You know, pick a name every day, 10 minutes and that volunteerism. And Michael's actually alluded to this a few different ways um, around what he's been talking about with mentoring others, coaching others, you know, these sorts of this making somebody's life better is actually a huge piece of the social connection and gets you a lot of wellness 
brownie points there. So, so, you know, finding meaning through helping others is a huge part of what I think can be done on a daily basis. It could be something small, like, Hey, I'm going to the grocery store. Can I pick you up some flowers or pick you up, you know, uh, some milk? Cause I happen to be going there and I'm, you know, that, that sort of giving back is huge. So, so these are some very practical things we talked about getting in nature, you know, maybe meditating a little bit if it's accessible to you, but it doesn't have to be too complicated. It could be a 30 minute walk, you know, in nature with some trees around and with a friend, you know, you uh, check in on a friend on the way back and say hello, and then you um, get a good night's sleep and, you know, cook somebody you love uh, something healthy. And, and, you know, these simple things can actually make a huge difference for you choosing the right things for you feeling, you putting yourself in a place where you're taking care of yourself can actually make you do better with this type of um, degenerative disease, similar to Alzheimer's, similar to many things that we have control. It's not just me giving you a pill, you take it and you just sit there passively waiting for the next pill to be given. No, you're actually making choices every day that are gonna impact how you do. Definitely, I love that idea. Just as Michael said, find somebody who you can aspire like you said, that does nothing but help you earn brownie points. So it's great for both people um, and helping them to stay connected. So thank you both so much. That does conclude our Q&A session. Thank you guys for taking the time to answer these questions. Um, this was a great way to connect with our veterans, our Parkinson's community. So thank you again. It was a pleasure having you guys. I do have a couple more notes um, to our audience. If you guys don't mind staying with me, I will share my screen. Okay. Are you guys able to see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so to our Parkinson's community, um, we have started a new initiative meant to capture the community's perspective on various topics in Parkinson's disease, like mental health, telehealth, and more. By signing up for this initiative, we will email you up to four times a year requesting you complete a 10 to 20 minute survey, and we will always report the findings back to the community. Sorry, I'm having troubles advancing my screen. <laughs> we hope you will come back soon for our future Veterans in PD events, as well as our other virtual education programs like our PD Health at Home, where you can participate in Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesday, Wednesdays, and Fitness Fridays. Last but not least, we are here for you. If your question wasn't answered, I encourage you to contact our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO, where a Parkinson specialist would be more than happy to hear from you. We hope that each of you will reach out to the VA and the Parkinson's Foundation for more support, resources, and guidance on your journey. Both organizations are here for you and we look forward to connecting. As our program concludes, a window will open with a link to complete an evaluation for today's program. We would love to get your feedback on this program and hear of other topics you would like to learn about. In the following days, you will receive an email with a link to view the recording of this presentation on YouTube, a list of all the URLs that we shared, and the evaluation link if you have not completed it already. In closing, thank you again for joining us today and thank you for your service to our country. Stay well and come back soon. <laughs>